fantastic point of view. No one to tell us no or where to go. I say we're only dreaming.
the advanced class did this year was to help educate the public on recycling our textiles and what happens when our textiles fill the landfills. So they are going to present to you their information that they found. So facts on why you should recycle your clothing and not throw it away. In 2017, America and Canada discarded 26 billion pounds in clothing and textiles. These textiles end up in landfills decomposing to produce greenhouse gases. 97% of post-consumer textile waste is reusable. About 15% of clothings from Americans are recycled or donated. The rest goes to landfills. Most Americans don't know when they donate their clothes to organizations. A maximum of 20% of what they receive in their shop will be sold. The for-profit textile recycling companies then buy the leftover clothes and recycle them. High-end companies like Burberry would burn 300 million in clothing to prevent their clothes being sold at discount price to the wrong people. Facts on why you should recycle your clothing and not throw it away. Textiles that go into the landfill have harmful side effects. They decompose and release methane, a harmful greenhouse gas that is a big contributor to global warming. The dyes and other chemicals can leach into the soil and can contaminate surface and groundwater, harming human and wildlife. Many of these textiles take months, years, hundreds of years to break down. Following the industrial revolution and the rise in corporation during World War II gas emission has been on the rise. Repurpose. Making new things out of old clothes. Sort the textiles that you no longer need. Identify a charity to receive your donation. Sort through your recycle pile and look for items that can be repurposed. And how you can reuse, um, re reuse and recycle or create new pieces of clothing of any style or, and sizes. Create handbags and reusable tote bags. Create kids' toys. So here are some places you can donate your clothing to. Recology of the Coast, Goodwill Stores, or Scrap. Thank you for listening to our presentation. They had to research the evolution of different clothing items, and we're going to introduce two of those to you, one being denim and one being menswear. <coughs> so the evolution of denim. In the late 18th century, this was the birth of the denim, denim fabric. The origins are unknown, and they were first mentioned in 1798. In 1872, this is the origin of Levi and Strauss Co. Levi is famous for his denim pants and the metal ribbon. Early 20th century denim as workwear, comfortable and durable clothing. During the war, there was a decline in denim after World War II. Denim was worn for leisure activities. In 1950, denim becomes fashionable, zippers incorporated, young people start wearing denim outside of work. In 1950, popularity raises concern 
fought for rebellion back from schools. In 1960, this was the Hippie Revolution, which is associated with youth and individuality. So students wore denim to protests, and denim for women became slimmer and wider at the bottom. In 1970, this is the demand for denim. They were accepted as go-to pants, and flared and bell-bottoms jeans surged in popularity. And denim customization was also very popular. In 1980, this is the rise of designer denim jeans, like Calvin Klein and Armani, and also the skinny fit. In 1990, this is the hip-hop denim, commonly used for men, and the jeans were loose-fitted and baggy. 2000 customized denim. People started to personalize their denim with stickers and patches. 2010, return of denim. Mom, boyfriend, slim, skinny, Levi's. Hi, I'm Meg, I'm here, and we're going to be talking about the evolution of menswear. So, in 1930, in the, the bigger was better, with double-breasted suits, full-cut trousers, and tuxedos, with tails setting the standards for now a gentleman should dress. Also, the down of shirtless unbathing. In the 1940s, war changes everything. The government restricts the use of wool, and single-breasted jackets and cuff and pleat-free pants become the norm. Once the boys come home, big style wars back with wide lapels, spread collars, and roomy suits. In the 1950s, conservatism and conformity rule with trim tailoring and similar accessories such as hats, pocket squares, cigarettes, and martinis for just about everyone. Downtown sees the occasional glimpse of flair. In the 1960s, the revolution arrives with JFK's formality giving a giving way to flared trousers, flower shirts, white lapels, and other assorted movements. In the 1970s, the Peacock Revolution leads to the rise of loose-collared culture. The constructed tailoring takes rise in floppy collars rule. In the 1980s, it's morning in America with broad shoulders, framing power, ties and suspenders, bold colors, and graphic patterns convey a new national confidence. In the 1990s, the bridge to the 21st century brings great change, with the loose, baggy silhouette of the early 90s leading to a slimmer suit profile. Business casual enters the lexicon. In the 2000s, men started dressing up again in the current era of sartorial individuality, colored, <coughs> such as colors, patterns, or style commences.
due to my new position. And it's thanks to the two of them that a lot of these students were able to finish their projects and this fashion show was able to happen. And I, and I'm in debt to them, in debt to them and I can't thank them enough. And then I have one more surprise. For those of you that told me that you were going on to fashion, in the future, I put your name in a little cup. And Chloe, you are the one. It is not a letter. It is a gift certificate for two hundred and fifty dollars for three days of fashion at the Fitting Summer Workshop. So I'd like to thank all of you for.